A reading from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while seventy years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The Word of God. Let my tongue be silenced if ever I forget you. Let my tongue be silenced if ever I forget you. By the streams of Babylon we sat remembering Zion on the willows of that land we hung our hearts let my tongue be silenced if ever I forget you there are captors asked us song in a foreign land. If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand be forgotten. Let my tongue be silenced if If ever I forget you, if I prize not Jerusalem above all joy, let my tongue be silenced. If
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. This is not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light. So that is his works, so that his works might not be exposed to the light. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light, 
so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Greetings, church. My name is Barbara Koop. My husband, Charlie, and I have been parishioners at St. Nicholas for 41 years. Many years ago, my call to parish ministry as the director of religious education started right here in this parish with Sister Virginia Adler as my mentor. So I'm really delighted to be with you today. If you're like me, you come to the fourth week of Lent wondering, where did all my good intentions go? So let's look deeper into the meaning of today's gospel to help on our Lenten journey. With Holy Week on the horizon, we continue hearing from this author, John. If you haven't already noticed, John's rendition of Jesus' life and mission is somewhat unique from all the other evangelists. His writing is so rich in images and holds much deep knowledge and meaning. Now today's story is about Jesus meeting Nicodemus. What we heard today actually sets the stage for excuse me, what we'll hear now from me will set the stage from what we, for what we heard today. This is the story that comes before the reading we had today, and I think it's important enough to talk about it. We learn that Nicodemus is from the Pharisees' sect, a prominent leader among the Jewish community, and possibly a rabbi, a teacher. But what we don't know is why Nicodemus wants to meet up with Jesus in the darkness of night. Jesus is not sure of Nicodemus' motives. Is he ashamed to be seen with this wanted man? Is he really a seeker of truth? Or is this a test or a challenge for Jesus? So when Nicodemus names Jesus a teacher who has come from God, it does reassure Jesus that this is not a trap. Nicodemus actually wants to bring up some deep issues. He's got some really heavy-duty God questions for Jesus. After Jesus tells him, yes, you're absolutely right, I am a teacher from God, Jesus then turns around and challenges Nicodemus. Jesus makes him an example to all of the leaders in this community. Those who are quite sure they know Jesus, they've been following what he does, but they have not yet committed to him. As Jesus continues this conversation with Nicodemus, we hear many familiar words such as being born again, from above or in the light. Entering the kingdom of God is another phrase we hear, and living a new life in order to obtain eternal life. As lovely as those words are, they still perplex Nicodemus. It's like, what are you talking about, Jesus? How can anyone be born again if they're already born and they've already come to be grown-ups? You can't re-enter your mother's womb because you're already earthside. And then what is this kingdom of God you speak of? Where is it? But instead of answering Nicodemus' question straight on, Jesus actually chides him. He says, Nicodemus, you're a respected teacher of Israel. You don't know these basics? 
This is part of the covenant that God has with our people. At this point, Jesus continues speaking from his own experiences. He came to show us a way to live in God's kingdom. To see Jesus is to see God's vision for all of human life. It is a vision that challenges us to leave the life of darkness, resentment, deception, envy, and hatred. We are reminded that when we let go of our own self-interests, sacrificing for values greater than our own, we will experience the joy of God's presence. When we choose to live in the light with a transformed and purified heart, we will experience being in tune with this vision of God. We will experience unending life, eternal life. Now, at this point in the scriptures, we don't hear from Nicodemus again until later on in the gospel during the Passion. But Nicodemus' story is so important for the large community of Jews that were living there at this time. God's presence in our life can always be lively and energetic, but still, God calls and invites us to respond. And our response emerges from that partnership that we have with God through Jesus. So John is telling the community, commit or move on. But for the Jews at this time, it was a dangerous proposition, as it is with us sometimes. Many Jews of the time did become followers of Jesus, and they still worshiped in their synagogue. In Marcus Borg's book, Reading the Bible Again for the First Time, Borg clarifies, this was a time of very bitter conflict in the Jewish community. They were called Christian Jews they were experiencing sharp social ostracism from all the non-Christian Jews. They even were told to get out of the synagogue. And by telling his community to, in effect, stay within the community of Jesus, John wasn't implying that they should just reject all other religions but just stay away from the synagogue across the street. This was not a rejection of Judaism, as some have portrayed it. Rather, it was a pastoral exhortation to a specific community in a specific historical setting. And that's important for us to realize. Because as Christians, we have hopefully come to a deeper understanding from which we can say and profess wholeheartedly that Jesus is all in all with strong conviction. But to say this with also, also saying God is not only known in Jesus. So in summary, Today's reading gives us three significant take-home ideas to live by. First of all, we must consciously choose to be reborn in the Spirit or to be born anew and live a new life with an openness to becoming a new creation. Secondly, by living with a new vision, of this interconnectedness of all of life that we know is here, we will come to the fullness of life that is unending. 
Our third takeaway is that Jesus came into this world to fully reveal the heart of God. As a human like us, he showed us God's deep love for the world. Now, if we look at our world from the International Space Station, our world is stunning, and we love it. But looking at our world up close and from down here, not so much, especially this last year and the years preceding that. The concerns in our world are ever growing. As the first reading says, the abominations just keep coming. Just this past year of pandemic and pandemic fatigue, this alone has brought some of us to our darkest days. The pain and the suffering have been insurmountable. But dawn is promised. Some people question spending so much time on the text of the scriptures or the words. Well, words do have meaning. And today's message can not only clarify some things for us, they can also challenge us. The ways in which we live more fully as disciples in the here and now, in the light, in our world of today, will be as unique as each one of us. Let's take just a few minutes and look at how we might live as disciples in the light. How about spending time on self-care to help our COVID fatigue? You know, the third part of the most important commandment, love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. We often forget that third part. Can we make time in our lives to be in silence with ourselves and the Holy One? Meditating, listening to music, reading, taking a nap, dancing and connecting to nature, even walking your dog in an intentional way can be a sacred and invigorating time. Can we continue to question ourselves if our own reality is the most true to the gospel message of Christ and turn from darkness of self-deception? Can we let go of the notion that everything depends on us and appreciate how the gift of God's grace operates in our life? So that when we're ready, when we feel refreshed, when we feel confident, and we feel like getting out there again, we might take our love straight into the world, which needs it desperately. So can we bring care and compassion to the hungry, the homeless, the jobless, those suffering financial insecurity? those even struggling with anxiety and isolation and who are at a risk for suicide. Can we open our hearts and teach and reach out to provide solace for those suffering from illness, exhaustion, and profound grief? Can we raise our voices tirelessly to end systemic racism, gun violence, inadequate education, domestic abuse? Can we reject being trapped by societal rules and norms that dictate who is acceptable and who is undesirable in this society and broaden our own horizons to include people of all races, colors, creeds, sexual orientation? abilities, and even political opinions? Can we labor in love with terrified refugees and immigrants and those justly or unjustly incarcerated, 
just like our own Peace and Justice Ministry does here in St. Nick's. Can we advocate for environmental justice like Hazel Johnson? She's a Southeast Chicago Catholic who worked for 30 years to provide communities equal protection and equity before she passed. Can we persist in the ongoing marathon to reform our church so it will become a discipleship of equals? Because if you hadn't noticed, our institutional church is flying on one wing and breathing with one lung. And lastly, but not least, can we, re can we perform holy dissent and stand in solidarity with those women whose call to the priesthood is not recognized by our church because of their gender? Now we could all add, even though that was an enormously long list, we could all add to this list by ourselves in our own concerns and needs. But this is not just a Lenten to-do list. This is the lifelong cost of discipleship. We're called to this labor of love, which may become, at times, a brawling struggle with the powers of injustice and oppression. But as Father Halstead remind us, uh, reminded us on the first Sunday of Lent, we're not alone in this endeavor. We are now and will forever be surrounded by the ever-present spirit of light and love. For the Church, for the Pope's visit to Iraq to bear fruits of mercy for all the people there, and for the Church of Iraq to be renewed in hope, we pray. For refugees at our border, for families torn apart by forces beyond their control, and for the people working to unite them, we pray. For patience and perseverance in the battle against the coronavirus, for weary health care workers, and for vaccines to reach those most in need, we pray. For our St. Nicholas community, that we may each know ourselves as God's handiwork, God's work of art, we pray. For our RCIA candidates, for Diana Roman, Oscar Mora, and Muhaji Smith, who will be baptized at the Easter Vigil, and for Matt Brands completing his initiation, we pray. For our sick, both known and unknown to us, for comfort, courage, and healing, we remember Techi Ebi, Camilo Mancera, Gabrielle Traxler, Phil Troy, Nancy Gerard, Michael McGinty, Vicky Moreno, Mary Lerps, John Oldershaw, and Father Tito, we pray. For our dead, now in the arms of God, for Shirley Allen, mother of Greg Allen and Karen Allen, Carol Gachins, Marlene McCauley, buried from St. Nicholas this past week, Michael Burns, and Amelia Ramos, and for those whom Mass is offered today, Angel Palomino, Luis Angel Tinoco, Rainy Feberg, Techi Ibe, Jose Delgado, and Paula Gomez, we pray. For the prayers deep in our hearts, beyond the place of words, but within the reach of God. For the prayers in the hearts of prisoners and refugees, and for all that is written in our parish book, we pray.
The Holy Week schedule is as follows. Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday will follow the current weekend Mass schedule. As usual, the 10.15 Mass in English and the 1 p.m. Mass in Spanish will be live-streamed. Bilingual Triduum services will also be live-streamed. Holy Thursday at 7.30 p.m., Good Friday at 7.30 p.m., and the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday at 8 o'clock p.m. Those wishing to attend these liturgies in person should register early. NickChurch.org Remember our Lenten almsgiving project, and please consider donating to the Rice Bowl. Materials can be picked up at the church and chapel doors for those who attend liturgies in person, but may also be picked up from the rectory during office hours. We ask them to be returned with your donation in two weeks on Palm Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.